G'day, Tom here from Reformers Bookshop. We're here at PTC Victoria, and we're very privileged to have Peter Hasty join us. Thank you for joining us, Peter. Pleasure, Tom. Yeah. Uh, now, what do you do here at the college? Uh, well, I serve as a member of the staff in the capacity as the principal of the college, and I've been here for about seven and a half years now. Okay. Yeah. I was previously a pastor in the Presbyterian Church, First of all, in uh, Wangaratta in Northern Victoria, where I was for seven years, and that was largely a church planning situation. And then latterly, uh, for 25 years in Asheville Presbyterian Church okay. in the inner west of Sydney. Actually, that's something we, we've interviewed a couple of the lecturers here, and something I've noticed is they all have some link in, in their past or even currently to pastoral ministry. Um, is that something that you think is important as a college? Oh, it's critical. I think if a student or a person who's studying theology who's got Christian vocation in mind, uh, they need uh, in one respect to be instructed by people who have got some significant pastoral experience. Uh, it's very easy, I think, in you know, the study of theology to, to become overly academic and uh, not realising the extent to which theology is meant to impact the life of the church and somebody who's been in the midst of all of mm. that and who's had teaching responsibilities uh, understands that and is more sensitive to it uh, in some respects than people who haven't had the experience. Mm. The other thing I'd say is you, you cannot teach what you don't know and it's very difficult to give what you don't have and experience is a critical factor in developing a mature approach to ministry and somebody who's been in you know the rough and tumble of pastoral life mm. knows that better than others and it means that you've got a degree of authenticity when you speak in a classroom or in a lecture room or in a tutorial and people understand the reality of what you're talking about mm. Mm. and so as, as the principal here what is your heart for this college what is it you're, you're desiring that this college does uh, well, my great desire is that as people come here, they may be able to, you know, fulfil the first and the second commandment, really. Mm. Jesus said, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Yeah. So the Christian faith uh, has a, a significant intellectual component, yeah. and you cannot truly love God if your mind is not attuned to Scripture. And that means a developed understanding and a maturing understanding of Scripture. And then secondly, uh, you've got to be able to love your neighbour as yourself mm -hmm. and ministers of all people yeah. uh, have to be devoted. I mean, one of the great lessons, I think, of the, the second and third century church is the extent to which ministers put their lives on the line for the people of their church. Mm -hmm. You know, when everybody else would flee from a city that was suffering from plague, uh, you know, Rodney Stark, the American sociologist, reminds us that one of the great reasons for the growth of Christianity was the courage, the bravery and the commitment of pastors to their flocks. So I think, you know, it is really important that uh, we develop a sense of obligation to other people mm -hmm. and people know that, you know, we, we love them and we are concerned for them uh, in a temporal sense as well as in a spiritual sense. Mm -hmm. And so the job of a theological faculty is to impart that broad reach of love um, or impact of love that you know we, we understand that we have to pass on our love for God mm. but also our love for others. So we'll talk about love for God um, in a moment yeah but what is it that we that you can do as a college to uh, impart that love of other people? Okay well one of the things that we have to do is we have to understand who people are. Mm. Uh, they're made in the image of God. So that implies uh, using our intellectual skills and uh, asking God to, to illumine our minds as we read the Bible uh, to understand just the glory and the grandeur of being human mm. and understanding God's purpose for us and the significance of human life, which you know is challenged in a myriad of ways these days. And uh, human beings feel terribly undervalued in our society. I'm sure that's one of the reasons why so many people have difficulty, uh, you know, with mental health and uh, actually with the whole struggle of living. 
uh, because they don't understand it. And so uh, it seems to me to be a critical aspect of knowledge mm. that we have to pass on. Mm. Mm. Excellent. Uh, and so apart from being principal here, do you do any teaching? Uh, yes, I teach in a number of different areas. Uh, I teach uh, principally in the area of theology, so I teach systematics. Uh, I teach uh, ministry formation, okay. which is a very important subject, as is Christian worship. So I teach those and I also teach a number of other smaller subjects, uh, like biblical theology. Okay. Mm. So what do you mean by ministry formation? Our ministry formation looks at the whole idea of uh, God's calling mm -hmm. in our lives and God's gifting in our lives. Okay. All Christians are called into the fellowship of Jesus Christ, uh, God's Son. So in that sense, all Christians are called. Uh, all Christians are also called to their various stations in life. So a person who may be involved as a nurse or a teacher or yeah. a tradesman or something like that has a specific gifting and calling, uh, but it's not exercised necessarily within the, a teaching role within the church. Mm. Uh, what we're looking at here is the idea that uh, people who have been uh, given certain spiritual gifts, uh, which are obvious to the members of the community of faith uh, and its leadership, and also have uh, certain personal characteristics, particularly aspirations uh, for leadership and spiritual service, and also a capacity to teach. Mm -hmm. So we're looking specifically for people in that area. I mean, all Christians in that sense are called but some are specifically called uh, to Christian ministry and mm -hmm. Christian ministry of a teaching nature. So the college in that sense plays an, a critical role in their personal and ongoing formation mm. in both knowledge and ministry skills right. as well as character development. So there's a, a threefold component in uh, a person's development while they're at college and we're interested in every aspect of it, not just their academic results. Mm. Mm. And often when we talk about calling to the ministry, uh, people talk about an internal call and an external call. Yeah. Can you uh, help me understand the, the difference and what, what, asp what part each plays in the, the call of a person to... Well, I ministry? think they all play a significant role. I mean, the word calling... Uh, in one sense, can be a little unhelpful okay. in in this in this particular discussion because uh, you know there's a vast history behind Christian vocation, yeah. which is both complex and tortuous, and it's led to some fairly uh, difficult results in the life of the church, where people were ultimately regarded as uh, well essentially divided into two orders you know those okay. who are involved in common works yeah and those who are involved in religious or spiritual works the, the sacred secular divide yeah yeah, yeah. Sort so of elite, elite spiritual nature of the priests yeah the yeah. idea really began very early in the church uh, I think Eusebius and others were involved in in contrasting or making an unfair contrast in some parts of the Gospels you know that differentiated people into these spheres mm. Uh, I think, you know, in hindsight, Christians of latter ages uh, who have had, you know, more opportunity, obviously, to reflect on the subject than others might have, uh, have seen that that's probably not the most helpful division, mm -hmm. uh, that God calls everybody to their various vocations, yeah. uh, but he does gift and gives a sense of aspiration or strong desire, which we might refer to as a calling, okay, yeah. uh, to those who are going to serve in his church. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we obviously are concerned about is that people have a sense of strong desire or yeah. aspiration. Yeah. Others might call it a call. Yeah, uh, aspirations I'm, I'm, that pulling off that biblical text, isn't it? He yeah. who aspires to Yeah, be, yeah. he who aspires, yeah. But I mean, the idea is there present in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, for example. Christ gave gifts to mm. people. So Christ gives these desires as well as the gifts and people ought to have that strong internal 
desire or aspiration mm-hmm. for service and leadership. And that should be confirmed by the wider church. Mm-hmm. Uh, people, you know, are not, are not, in a sense, flying solo in the Christian life. Uh, they're flying in union with other people. Mm-hmm. And their gifts, their aspirations, and their own integrity of life and their capacity to serve can be fairly judged by their brethren. Mm. And uh, that's what should happen in the church in the whole process of ordination. It's simply a formal recognition by the church that this aspiration and desire and gifting is present in a person's life. Mm. And so if if there was uh, someone who was considering the ministry, are there some, some books that you'd recommend that, to help them consider this? Well, there, there are a number of books which I've found helpful. Um, there are many books written on the subject. Not all of them are as insightful, but there are some. Um, one of the books I think that I'd mention is this book uh, by Dr. Robert Clinton. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's The Making of a Leader, uh, Recognising the Lessons and Stages of Leadership mm-hmm. Development. But he's talking about leadership development specifically in people who are involved in some form of Christian ministry of the Word of God. Right. Okay. And he helpfully, I think, analyzes uh, such issues as uh, various phases in a person's life or patterns in a person's life, stages of development, that is, through which Christians normally proceed as they move into ministry and then fruitful and mature Christian service. And I think it's really important that people do develop that kind of overlay Mm. in terms of looking at their life because there are a variety of processes that take place within our lives uh, that we're not overly uh, aware of Mm -hmm. or adept at assessing uh, but somebody who's spent a lifetime of study of this particular subject can actually objectively analyze for us and, and and point us to some very significant things that we need to notice along the way and so this particular book I think is really good. Uh, it reminds us, for example, how you know there are certain foundational aspects in a person's life where God is acting sovereignly uh, without any involvement, in a sense, on their part or in their part. Uh, you know, for example, the family into which they're born yep. may yep. not be Christian. It may be Christian. The country where they live. Uh, the influences that come into their life, the significant events that happen to them in their personal development, most of those things are beyond their control Mm. and they're, in a sense, unplanned. But they have a powerful impact in shaping a person and preparing them for ministerial readiness. Mm. So um, this book, you know, identifies those sorts of things and then it, it looks at how God actually leads people to himself and how he uh, creates in them a desire to uh, read scripture, how he leads them to pray, Mm. and shows a number of internal processes that are taking place in a person's life that ought to be there. And those who are involved in assessing their progress in ministry uh, should be aware of themselves. And then he talks about another phase, which in a sense represents the period in life that... uh, that embraces the kind of people that we deal with, uh, people who are moving into what he would describe as phase three, right. uh, where they're maturing in uh, ministry. They're getting specific training in the kind of information and knowledge uh, and experience that they will need to be effective in pastoral ministry, missionary work or whatever. And uh, then he looks at their giftings and how their giftings are developed at that point. And then he moves on to post-college experience uh, where people go into a life of full involvement in ministry and how they begin to perfect their skills and also improve their relationships with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that phase is a critical area in relationship development. And then he goes on and looks at a couple of other phases that follow on from there where uh, we need to you know, pay careful attention to people who are in their second and third decade, fourth decade of, of ministry and what they can expect. And I think to be fully prepared in that way is very important to people who mm. are just starting out. They need to have a clear 
idea of, of the are. kind of stages of development through which they're going to progress and uh, where they stand in that process themselves. And if there are particular spiritual checks that need to be uh, observed in their life, uh, like an obedience check or an integrity check or whatever it is, we can identify all these tests in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to know that we've actually passed them ourselves as well as those who mm. are involved in our appointments or selection. Yeah, so it's, it's a very important book. Uh, there are a couple of others I could mention. Uh, there's this one uh, by Michael Milton, who used to be the, uh, the president or the chancellor, I think it was, of uh, the Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson. And that covers the other Reformed Theological Seminaries in the United States. But uh, M Michael Milton was called late into the ministry. Right. Late in uh, life. Yeah. He was quite successful in business and uh, he, you know, he'd obviously performed very well there and proven himself in business. But he felt increasingly uh, led to consider gospel ministry. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't sure exactly how that would take place, but he was a mature age person with a child uh, when, he, when he became involved. And uh, he's written this book, which I think is a very important book, actually. It's a series of short articles, which deals with uh, a theology of calling, uh, reflections on it, uh, examples of calling in the Bible. I think one of the reasons we need to read that is because he talks about those who are called who are very young mm -hmm. and those who are called later in life. Mm -hmm. And we tend in our culture to only consider people who are in their late 20s, early yeah, 30s. Yeah and primarily between the ages of 30 and 50. He indicates that there were men called far younger than that. So, you know, that it's possible for um, mature, mature Christians to be called at an earlier time in their life. And when you think of all the pressures that come upon people today, uh, that's an important consideration to bear in mind. The fact that, you know, people like Samuel mm. and Jeremiah and Timothy were called at relatively young ages. And he also surmises that um, you know the apostle, uh, the apostles like James and John and Peter and Andrew may have also been called in their late teens. We don't know, but they're working with their father, mm. so the possibility exists that they were young men who'd been trained earlier in their trade of fishing. Um, he talks about challenges of the call, uh, how to select a, a college or a seminary. Mm -hmm. Uh, the kind of life a seminary family ought to have, uh, the ministry of a person in a college, uh, finding your place in the church, post-seminary stress syndrome, uh, how to lose your ministry while excelling in your profession, the life cycle of a pastor. They're all brilliant subjects. Excellent. And he's been through them all. Yeah. Uh, and he's academically trained in theology, obviously, and holds a doctorate in it, but he's got other areas of life that feed into this experience. So that's a very good book. And there's another one, uh, this time by the president of a, a Baptist uh, seminary, Midwestern Seminary in the United States. And this is a brilliant little book as well. Uh, it's got a very strong endorsement by Al Mohler in it. Uh, but, you know, he asks, what does it mean to be called into ministry? And uh, he talks about the desire for ministry. Uh, does your character meet God's expectations? Is your household in order? Has God gifted you to preach and teach his word? Does the church affirm your calling? Do you really love the people of God? Are you passionate about the gospel and the Great Commission? Are you engaged in fruitful ministry? Are you ready to defend the faith and are you willing to surrender? They're all the questions that I want our students to be able to answer. So uh, they're the kind of, that is the kind of book that every session in the Presbyterian Church or every board of elders, I guess, in a, a Baptist church or deacons, whoever they are, um, should be asking mm. of their candidates. So I think those three books put together is just a wonderful little package. So that's discerning your call to ministry. Yes, uh, how to know for sure and what to do about it. Fantastic. Yeah. Sounds like a great collection of books there. By Jason Allen. Uh, so that's you, your ministry... For Foundations, is that what it was called? Uh, ministry Formation. Formation. Yeah, close. <laughs> uh, and the other um, subject that you, that you said you teach was systematic theology. Yes. Um, now, 
why should we be interested in systematic theology? Uh, because we're told to love God not only with all our heart and our soul, but also with our mind, mm-hmm. as well as our strength. And uh, students need to use their minds and maintain their strength in a peer- four-year period of study. It's, it's a fairly strenuous and mm. uh, rigorous process, but it does require intellectual focus right. and grasp and uh, we can't do it in our own strength. We must rely upon God to help us. Uh, but that's one of the responsibilities of being a pastor, mm. to think biblically. Okay, and so that's probably a good, good segue into what is systematic theology? Okay, well, systematic theology is an attempt uh, to gather, as it were, all the various fragments of truth on a particular subject uh, within the Scripture into... Uh, sort of a comprehensive uh, arrangement so that we understand how all those integral pieces that we gather as we read the Bible historically, uh, which we call biblical theology, are actually integrated into Mm. a meaningful whole at the end of the process. So it's essentially uh, a reflection upon all the individual data on that particular subject into a comprehensive whole and statement. And it, it forces uh, a person to think significantly uh, about the truth that's contained in it, as well as the implications of the truth. Uh, it's not just enough to know the theology itself. Mm. One must also know the ethical outcomes and the, uh, the implications mm. of what you believe. And which incidentally is, uh, you know, I think a very helpful emphasis uh, that exists now in the academic programs that we're required to produce. Uh, We're not required just to teach about the theoretical nature of theology. We're also required to teach about its practical outcomes. Mm. That's Mm. very important. Uh, I'm I'm interested too, when did the church start doing systematic theology? Has it it always been around? Well, it has. Um, I think If you look, for example, uh, at Moses, Moses was uh, particularly concerned that people taught their families. Mm. Uh, They were taught to know the Lord. They were taught to talk about him and his ways in their lives and what he demands. Uh, It's a, you know, it's a mark of a godly man. Blessed is the man who does not walk in in the counsel of the ungodly, Mm. you know, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates both day and night. And so I think that is the mark of a godly man. Uh, I mean, it's Moses' charge really to Joshua, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do everything that's written in it, for then your way shall be prosperous and successful. So um, So you're saying that it... Even back then, what they're ask, what Moses is telling the people to do is to um, systematically think about what God's taught them about himself. Most definitely. And uh, it's meant to be not only appropriated for oneself, mm. it's meant to be passed on mm. to other people. Uh, so, you know, if the baton's been handed to me... Uh, My job is to hand the baton on to my wife and to my children and to all those whom I come in contact with, but specifically uh, to be engaged in passing on the faith or transmission of the faith. So um, theology is very important in that sense. I mean, the Great Commission tells us too to go into all the world and uh, make disciples and as we do so, uh, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. What did Jesus command us to do? Uh, he, the Lord your God. <laughs> yeah, he commanded us to love the Lord our God. But he also uh, encouraged us to hear both the law and the prophets. And he also entrusted <clears throat> in his final discourse uh, the ministry of uh, inscripturation to his own apostles. Uh, and he told them that the Holy Spirit would come and help them do that. So uh, I take it the whole biblical revelation is something that we're meant to be students of and pass on to others. And that is a sacred trust. Mm. 
and so that includes, I guess, both biblical and systematic theology yes. together. Yes. <coughs> understanding yes. the whole story, but also understanding who God is. Exactly. And who is like. You can only look. You know, if you're preaching through the Book of Genesis or you know one of the prophets, you can only handle the terrain that you're dealing with. But the preacher, as he gets in the pulpit, while he's considering the individual text or the specific text for the moment, will be relating that text to the whole of Scripture. Mm. And he'll be allowing uh, the analogy of Scripture to operate, which means he'll be informed by uh, further developments in that doctrine that he might find in later parts of the mm-hmm. Bible mm-hmm. and also read to be read in the light of earlier yeah. statements of Scripture. And that, I take it, is the job of a preacher, to be able to bring a systematic understanding to a faithful exegetical exposition of a passage of scripture at a particular point in time. So he'll not only tell you what it meant to the people there and then, but also draw out its implications for those of us who live today. Mm. Mm. And so what you're saying about Moses' charge to the people and to to Joshua suggests that uh, studying biblical or systematic theology is not just for pastors. No, it's, it's, it's actually, look, I mean, everybody's doing it. <laughs> Everybody's doing it. It's just whether you're doing it well or badly. Right, okay. You know, um, I mean, even even Christians who might be involved with their hands all day long, you know, there's usually something going on in their mind mm. as they're doing a lot of their work, especially if it's the kind of work that you can do where you don't have to think too much about it because it's often repetitive, but you can still have your mind on other things while you're doing it or at least keep your mind on both things, but you can be reflecting on it. I mean, we all do that, don't we? We go yeah. for a walk and we've got to think about something. Yeah. And we so just, you're saying that... We all... just don't walk around mindlessly. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying that all the time we're, we're building our concept of who God is. Yeah, I, I think so. And I think that's one of the reasons why scripture memory is so important. Mm. Uh, you know, I encourage my grandchildren uh, to... Uh, to learn and memorize the Bible, and I give them incentives to do it. And the reason I want, I, I ask people to do that, and I tell people that it's a good thing to do, is because their minds have got to be filled with something. Mm. And if they're not filled with God's truth, uh, they won't be fully, they won't, won't be fully formed as Christians. No. Mm. Mm. And so, then, if there's someone who would like to get into systematics, um, I'm quite excited. You've brought a few different systematic theologies along. Yeah. Uh, Can you help us work out where we should start and how we should progress? (coughs) Yes. Uh, I think you really need to start with something simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been numbers of sort of very simple primers uh, that, you know, people have have published, uh, which are very helpful. Uh, It might be just a little book, for example, on the Apostles' Creed Mm -hmm. that sets out, you know, the basic the basic teaching of the Christian faith. Uh, I've brought along today a few uh, books on systematic theology, but they're written at a more introductory level. Yep. So I could take you through some of them. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, if we start with somebody like James Montgomery Boyce, who I knew personally uh, and was a friend of mine, um, he published a series of sermons, I think, in a sense, <coughs> modelling himself on uh, a practice that Martin Lloyd-Jones had adopted some years earlier where he decided that he would preach on all the major doctrines of the Bible. Oh, very good. Okay. And uh, Lloyd-Jones, incidentally, has published a, a, a sort of a three-volume work uh, on that particular exercise. But uh, Montgomery Boyce, or James Montgomery Boyce, uh, published Foundations of the Christian Faith, which is called A Comprehensive and Readable Theology. And the reason it's comprehensive and readable is it because it was preached. Mm. which means I think all responsible Christian theology should be preachable. And if it isn't preachable, uh, it ought to be. Right. It needs to be preached. And the success, I think, of uh, Boyce's uh, book is that he covers all the major uh, loci of theology. So he deals with um, the knowledge of God, um, the Word of God, the attributes of God, God's creation, God the Redeemer, uh, the fall of the human race, law and grace, the person of Christ, the work of Christ, etc. Mm. But he does it in a very readable form. And I think one of the great advantages of uh, Boyce's book 
is that it's written to people in the late 20th century. Perfect. So it picks up a lot of the philosophical trends and errors that have been creeping into the church as a result of modernity and post-modernity. And uh, he alerts us to the implications of those for our faith. Mm. So if people are looking for something which is uh, very well written uh, and relatively simple, uh, Boyce's book is wonderful, a wonderful investment. It's good, it's good value. Uh, another one is written by uh, R.C. Sproul, Everyone's a Theologian. Yep. Introduction to Systematic. Yes, that's the one. Uh, the reason I like that one is because it's quite brief and it's very readable, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also extremely knowledgeable. It doesn't give you an in-depth grasp of theology, but it certainly takes you to all the major areas of theology and explains them simply. And uh, it uncomplicates the complexities of theology. Mm. So that's what Sproul was so good at. It's what Sproul is so good at. In fact, uh, you know, most of these uh, of these chapters were originally a series of talks that he gave, okay. or addresses that he gave, and uh, they've been condensed somewhat and trimmed a little, but they're essentially the substance of his series on the. Mm. On systematic theology and the doctrine of God so uh, it's a great little introduction and something that if you want to jump into a subject and you want to know the general boundaries of it and the important issues yeah. in it uh, Sproul will take you there and do it simply great starting point yeah um, Millard Erickson has written another book uh, introducing Christian doctrine yeah uh, that's the third edition one I don't know whether there's a fourth out yet but this was only relatively recently published uh, the reason I like this one is that it's, it's very simple, it's well written, it has a plan at the head of every chapter, uh, it explains contemporary contexts okay. in which we need to uh, appreciate Christian truth, uh, it gives a range of different points of view uh, in, each of the, in each of the sections. Uh, Erickson is, is uh, a conservative evangelical. He wouldn't necessarily stand within the reform camp. Uh, but he does, when he presents other people's points of view, generally present them quite fairly. Good. And uh, I found it an enjoyable read, and I've used uh, Erickson quite often to give me further insights and explanations. Mm -hmm. And he's especially good, too, at looking at... Uh, modern implications for some of these things yeah, uh, as i said you know not everybody uh who who may come from a sort of a reform background would necessarily agree with everything that he says but i find him quite illuminating and helpful and he also r r r writes in a very ironic style okay so he's a generous person in his estimate of other people which i think is an important is good. Yep. it's an important uh characteristic of a good theologian. Mm. Uh, this one by Michael Horton uh, is again uh, a smaller cut down version of a larger theology. It, it's, it's, pil so it's Pilgrim theology. Yeah, the, this is Pilgrim theology, uh, core doctrines for Christian disciples. And I think the, the larger one is called the Christian faith. That's the one, yeah, yeah. that's a very big one. Yeah. You wouldn't it want is. that one to drop on you from a great height. <laughs> You may not survive. But uh, this one is uh, a simple one, and uh, I like it because it purports to be uh, simple. And maybe it's not as simple as it could be. But one of the things that I really like about it is at the very end of the book, uh, Michael Horton has given uh, a series of diagrams, which I think are really useful at the back of the book. I think, yes. Um, from drama to discipleship, applying the coordinates to key doctrines. So he looks at how God communicates very aspects of his nature. Okay. So God's incommunicable attributes, his communicable attributes, the Trinity, creation, anthropology, etc. And he goes through all the doctrines of the Bible and he talks about how they're manifested in history and the drama of history. Uh, then he talks about the doctrine that they contain. Hmm. Uh, how this should cause us 
to live a life of praise and thanksgiving and also what implications it has for my life as a disciple. Mm. So it's quite practical. It's very practical and I think it's, it's a good emphasis. Um, we're not thankful enough in our Christian lives and we don't think through implications enough. Mm. And uh, Horton's aim here is to force us, in a sense, to do that. So I, I think it's quite a good book. Uh, moving on to more complex ones. Uh, this one here, uh, a, new, a New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith is by Dr. Robert Raymond. I'm always nervous of books that have new in the title. Well, yeah, so am I. <laughs> uh, whether he actually chose that title or not is another question. He possibly didn't. But uh, the publishers, uh, who are Thomas Nelson, may have chosen it. Of often authors... Don't get to choose their titles. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, it's an editorial prerogative. So occasionally you'll get editors who have got to fund the thing and distribute the thing, and or the publishers do, and they often have the final word on a title. So there you go. We it won't may, hold it against. It, 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 may, it may not be Robert <laughs> Raymond's fault. You know, he but might have, he might the, have called it something very boring, <laughs> and they decided to uh, somehow or other jazz it up to sell it. So it's not a new theology? No, it's not a new theology. And <laughs> I think the thing about uh, Raymond is that Raymond is very comprehensive in the way in which he writes. He's deeply respectful to past traditions, so he'll recognise uh, people from other faith traditions, that is within the Christian, Christian church, uh, and recognise when they've made significant contributions. Okay. Okay. So, for example, I, I'm, I don't know that he necessarily quotes... Pope Leo here but uh, for example somebody like Pope Leo who wrote a, a particular letter to uh, a man called Flavian uh, an emperor uh, wrote his famous tome about the person of Christ mm. and it is a brilliant exposition of the doctrine of Christ or Christology right. and uh, you know Raymond's the sort of person who is respectful of those things and can appreciate truth wherever it's found. Uh, but he does, obviously, uh, well, he is uh, a Presbyterian theologian and is a confessional theologian. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the filters that he puts on everything is whether it fits within the confessional framework mm -hmm. of the church and particularly the great confessions of the church. He also uh, stands in the tradition of John Calvin. Right. So he's... he's uh, he acknowledges Calvin's influence in theology and also in Christian devotion, so that comes to the fore. And uh, he's also a follower of, or at least he stands in the school of people like Van Til as a presuppositionalist. But having said all those things, uh, the great strength of this book, I think, is that it is confessional. It is basically exegetical. And he goes back and examines the uh, te important oh, texts in the light of Greek and Hebrew. And he gives, I think, a fairly balanced view of things. Uh, obviously, no one's ever going to agree with every point that yeah, a yeah. theologian makes. But I think it's the general contribution that he makes. And I think anybody who uh, reads a book like this is going to be a better preacher, a better theologian, and have a deeper appreciation uh, for the contribution of learned Christians and scholars uh, outside their own tradition, mm -hmm. but also for those within the tradition as well. Mm. So, um, wonderful. I thought that was a very good book and a helpful book. Uh, and, you know, this book, uh, Reform Dogmatics, uh, I've got volume two here, God and Creation, uh, by Herman Bav Inc. It's a four volume set. It is a four-volume set, and uh, we owe an enormous debt to uh, John Bolt and John Freend, uh, who is the translator. Bolt is the editor. Uh, Bolt has undertaken a massive task in editing virtually all of uh, Barving's works, hmm. and they're a gold mine. Uh, Barving lived over a century ago now, uh, but he was on the cusp of modernity, and he was sufficiently far-sighted to see where many of these modern trends would hmm. lead. He's a Dutch theologian, and so uh, we've really benefited, I suppose, by John Freend 
translating all these works. But Bolt has done an amazing job as the editor. And so it's, it reads well. it's good, readable English, and it's also very well cross-referenced. Mm. And Bolt is a prodigious theologian himself, but he's done an amazing amount of research in this particular area, and we're just indebted to him for his amazing contribution. And once you've read somebody like Barvink, um, you just give thanks to God for the treasures that he's given to his church. What's so, what's so good about the way that Bavink presents? Well, I think, first of all, it's lucid. Uh, it's very biblical. Uh, it's also got a profundity attached to it that you don't see elsewhere. And there's another one of his books, uh, which I'll mention shortly. Uh, he's got enormous insight to doctrines which are out of fashion. Right. And I'll mention that shortly in, mm. in the area of sin. But uh, I think... Barvink, you know, is a colossus in theology, and it, there's also a one-volume work, incidentally. Yeah, an abridged uh, version. An abridged version, and I think there's another translation coming out of his yeah. original one-version mm. commentary that mm. Bolt or somebody will be putting together. So they're amazing contributions, and we really should be thankful to God for their work. Mm. So that's a great overview of uh, a bunch of systematics yeah. um, that would keep someone busy for a while I think it would <laughs> but I, I, I should mention to you I think two areas where I think uh, the church is in real need yeah please um, first one is in the doctrine of God okay and the uh, pinnacle of the pinnacle theology. of Christian theology. revelation right and uh, there's a book here called God in the Wasteland uh, by David F Wells uh, David Wells uh, wrote uh, four books in this series, uh, God in the Wasteland, No Place for Truth, and uh, a couple of others. And then uh, he's also written a book, Courage to be Protestant, which in a sense is a, a, dis a distillation of all those four books right. into one book, uh, which lacks the comprehensiveness of the, the four in the series. Mm -hmm. But uh, this one book, God in the Wasteland, I think is so important for people who are living today. Uh, because it, it reminds us in David Wells' words, the problem with late 20th, 21st century is that God rests inconsequentially upon us all. Yeah, so is that getting at the idea that we just don't care? It's referring to the fact that since the Enlightenment, uh, certain doctrines have essentially been jackhammered out of the Christian faith. Okay. Okay. The doctrine of God being one of them. Uh, if you've read uh, a, a sort of a, a literary critic, a man by the name of uh, A. N. Wilson, uh, he's written numbers of books on you know the Victorian age and right. uh, Darwin and other people. Uh, Wilson isn't a isn't a Christian, but he's got some profound insight, historical insights. And one of the books that he's written is God's Funeral, hmm. which is an account of the 19th century and its attempt through major literary figures and other influence influential individuals uh, to write God out of the narrative of Western civilization. And so uh, I think David Wells is simply uh, looking at this phenomenon and saying, well, what are the consequences in the modern church? Mm. You know, that, that we, we are suffering a problem, he says, known as the weightlessness of God. God does not impinge on us in any significant way there is no fear of god before our eyes mm. there is no reverence for god and uh, that's manifest in the chaos and disorder of our own society mm. and our wider world that's interesting isn't it because in past times where uh, christianity has at least formed some sort of um, backdrop in, mm. in people's uh, understanding of the world mm. The, there's been this, you know, shared conscience or mm. shared fear of doing evil and things like that. Exactly. Right? And so, is he getting at the, the idea that we don't have that? He is. Days? He's reminding us that uh, that is a growing problem. It's absence in people's, you know, mental mm. framework mm. is is a is a crisis, a cultural crisis and a spiritual crisis, and. Uh, He's saying it's even worse because we're living in a reality uh, where, you know, we're, 
our world is just full of fading dreams. All the things that we've been promised mm. that secularism can deliver, it can't, mm -hmm. and we're left without solutions. Yeah. And without God, we're essentially left without meaning as well. So that's the cultural crisis and spiritual crisis that we all face, but particularly Christian leaders. Mm. And so if we want to lift God high in our thoughts... Yes. Uh, well, there, there are a couple of books here that I think I, I should mention to you. Um, this one is uh, by Matthew Barrett. Uh, Barrett is an up-and-coming theologian who's written quite prominently on a number of major areas. Mm. It's called None Greater, The yep. Undomesticated Attributes of God. Uh, Barrett's book, in a sense... I don't know whether he takes a cue from somebody like A.W. Tozer, who lived probably about 50, 60 years ago. But Tozer uh, wrote a book, uh, Knowledge of the Holy, yep. which was an examination of the attributes of God. And Tozer was warning about this very thing, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Right. Okay, that was a prominent element in his preaching. And he was saying that the church back in the middle of the 19th, 20th century was a church that was full of the world and... Uh, you know, vacuous in a sense of God. Mm -hmm. So Barrett is operating, I think, on similar assumptions, saying that one of the reasons why the church is suffering uh, a spiritual famine is that it's not feeding on the knowledge of God. Mm. And we have forgotten who God is, and particularly uh, we've forgotten about his attributes. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, how often do we hear preachers talking about the attributes of God? Um, Next to never. Probably, yeah. Uh, so he explores both the incommunicable attributes of God, those attributes which pertain to God alone, mm -hmm. as well as those that are communicable to us. And we're thinking now of particularly moral moral yeah, yeah. categories like Good, love, just, goodness, yeah. justice, etc., and he explores them all, and he does so in uh, in a very helpful way. He's he's quite folksy in his writing, so he gives you lots of contemporary illustrations mm -hmm. that make it clear. And uh, I found that a really enjoyable and helpful read. Uh, there's another uh, one that picks up on this uh, issue in the church, and this is by Terry Johnson. Johnson, I think, he, he, I think Johnson is an American. But he studied in Bristol, right. I think under Packer. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he left America and went there. And then he's gone on and done further study in the United States. But Terry Johnson uh, is a person who uh, has written quite extensively on a range of different subjects, uh, on Protestant doctrine. He's also written on worship and uh, various aspects of pastoral ministry. He's a pastor in Georgia. In, in Savannah, Georgia. Actually, I've, I haven't been to his church, but I've been to Savannah. And uh, he, his ministry is quite profound. He's written some very good sermons uh, that have been published on the parables and other areas, the Beatitudes. But this book on the identity and attributes of God by Terry Johnson, it's published by Banner of Truth, is an excellent book. Uh, as I read it, I think it, it's, it's really, in a sense... A compilation and a distillation of you know the best that comes from the Puritan era, mm. uh, but reshaped, refashioned, and uh, put in a contemporary context for p p modern consumption today. So it, it's it's an excellent book. It's this kind of book you know I think every theological student should have and read. Both those books uh, they really inculcate a deeper love for God, and then. There's another book here, uh, Reform Systematic Theology. This is a blockbuster, literally. Just feel the weight <laughs> of it. It's huge. Bust a block with it. <laughs> yeah. It's written by Joel Be Beakey and uh, Paul Smalley, Reform Systematic Theology, and the, this first volume is on Revelation and God. Yeah. Okay. I don't know when these gentlemen sleep. Um, <laughs> well, this is actually a, um, a distillation of his systematic lectures that he's done over his many College. decades of yeah. teaching. Well, obviously. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a massive work, but look, it's very readable yeah. and preachable. Yeah. And uh, it's a beautiful book. 
And doxological, if not. It's very doxological. And uh, the thing that I really like about it too is it draws out implications for modern living. Good. And it interacts with current problems in the church. Yeah. And it's got a profound level of insight, far greater than many other theologians that Mm -hmm. I have read. So uh, for those who want to engage in... You know, for example, you you read about the doctrine of divine simplicity. You know, yeah, ha- ask yeah. questions. Ask Christians, how much do you know about that? And yeah. most people say, what are you talking about? And then, what are the implications of it? I haven't got the faintest idea, but they're profound. They are. And uh, it takes us all the way back to the early church and some major disputes over the during the Christological mm-hmm. controversies, mm-hmm. and the importance this has for a person's life. So. Uh, although this is big, uh, one of the things that it's got is it's got uh, at the end of every chapter uh, things that we ought to be singing to the Lord, mm. uh, questions for meditation and discussion, uh, questions for deeper reflection, and lots of very helpful references. So that's so the three key- great books on that's the doctrine a, of God. That's a keeper, yes. And this one uh, I want to mention just. Last but not least, uh, Reformed Ethics by Herman Bavinck. Again, uh, this one, in a sense, could have been contained, uh, or part of it could have been contained, probably within his systematic systematics. But the thing about this book is that it has about the best exposition of sin that I have come across in a long time. Okay. Okay. So I started. You don't get many books on sin. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, someone came into the bookshop the other day and asked for one. Did they? And I, and I said, I don't think I've ever had anyone ask for a book on sin before. <laughs> well, this is it. Um, the reason I say it is because it's so readable and it is so penetrating. Not just because he lays it out like a professor of anatomy would lay out, you know, how the body mm, operates, mm. but he actually takes you into a person's soul. Mm. And as you read it, you feel like you're being x-rayed. I don't know if I want that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd, it makes you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I bet. But it does arouse the conscience. And he talks about uh, what it means to be under the power of sin, uh, how it devastates mm. the image of God in our lives. Mm. And then he looks at things like the organizing principle and classification of sins. And then he talks about sins against neighbour and God, sins of egoism, sins against the neighbour, sins against God. And, you know, he, he, he just unfolds how serious all this is and what consequences it has in your own life. And then he goes on to talk about the fallen image in, or the image of God in fallen human beings, the conscience, the law and natural morality, all of which are contentious issue amongst uh, evangelicals. Mm. But... This book is, you know, very revealing and uh, very searching. So people who want to be searched and uh, discover, you know, some of the great riches of the Christian faith would do well to get it. But as they read... I intend to give it away to friends. <laughs> Not that book, but copies thereof. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah. But as they read it and see their fallenness, they should probably read about God at the same time. Well, they should, and but I, I'm, I'm hopeful that... <laughs> You know, the reason I mentioned the one on sin is because the things that seem to be lacking in our culture are a a concentration on God and a faithful preaching about sin. It's very true. Without which uh, people cannot see the need for a redeemer. Exactly. Or his work. Or appreciate the grandness of his work. No, exactly. Mm. Um, Just enormity of it and completeness and perfection of Mm. it. Mm. Mm. Well, it's been a joy, Peter. Thank you very much, Tom.